There she is. Hi. Hey, Dana. Um, so I'm going to give it just a second for a few people to get on. But while we do that, I'm adjusting my like camera here so that it's in frame. Um, I felt the my so today is the the topic of from my book is the the topic on the gift of gut and our bodies and i um so it's chapters what is that four and five <clears throat> and i felt i had a gut feeling that i was supposed to get on to talk about these today um without putting on my like normal makeup and cute outfit and the things that i would normally do um just to kind of indicate or give an example of of the the person that is in these chapters or the stories that's in these chapters and you can kind of see my face here is like literally red so this is i worked out this morning so that was the decision i made i didn't i either could not work out and do makeup or i could work out and not do makeup like i didn't have time to do both and so my body my gut told me you need to work out so i went and i worked out which meant that i was not going to have time to put um to put makeup on and this is what my face looks like when I work out it turns bright red I talk about this in the book that because of just my DNA you know my body when I exercise I turn bright red and I sweat a lot just a lot I get like soaking wet so as a kid growing up I the teachers and like people would always ask me oh my gosh are you okay is everything okay? Like, because I was so red. And so I, I, I heard that so many times. I didn't ever want to like run or mm. do sports or anything because I knew I would get re red and all hot and sweaty. And so because of that, because of like the getting red, getting hot and sweaty, like it made me not want to do activities. It made me want to just hide. And so this it's is that my way shame, of, right? It is that shame so, speaking. I can so relate. So oh, relate. It was so hard this morning to like, yeah. I literally looked at my makeup brushes and I was like, maybe I'll just go live later. Maybe right. I'll just wait longer. <laughs> and so I have time to put to cover, right? To cover yeah. the blemishes, the things that we don't yeah. like about ourselves. Well, and, what's so fun too, Jess, like you invited me this morning and I had that same gut reaction, like, oh. I just got, I literally just jumped off my bike from my bike ride this morning. And I was like, but I'm not ready. And you're like, I'm not either. Let's just do this. And, and I just have this feeling it's better. And, and I think that, that it's really important as leaders and, and female leaders in particular to recognize that we're human. This is, this is our humanness. This is our humanness in the morning, you know, and, and to have that shame for our bodies sometimes it, it's such an interesting journey for each of us individually. And I think it's important that other females are showing other females. It's okay. We're, it's normal to have your humanness. Your humanness is beautiful and your makeup and, and cute outfit is beautiful too. Both are beautiful Absolutely. because you're a whole human. Absolutely. And I, I think what's interesting for me is to think about kind of the, the neurological background that um, the, the neuroscience behind what is it causes that in instinct to for you know so this morning when I'm deciding to get on here without getting ready without putting on makeup the in, my instinct was to put to put something on because in the past not putting something on has a consequence right so somewhere along the way it it, it was programmed in me and I, I talk about it with our gut because that's our gut brain is where our safety where our safety lives mm -hmm. is in the neurons that that exist within our gut and so my my response was protect yourself cover yourself you know hide the real you you know so that you can be safe so that you're not you don't have to be afraid um of what what people think and um and and so i think it's interesting when you think about that of those experiences that we had as children and how they then get embedded in us and make it d more difficult yeah. for us to overcome yeah i and and i think this is so relatable msa botic i don't know if i'm saying that right but she said um, she said, isn't it crazy how we get shamed for things that are so natural and beyond our control? And I, I completely agree with that. I've had to really take time. So I'm a six foot woman 
And to be six feet and a woman in this world is, um, I get stares, I get lots of comments about my body uh, all the time. People will talk, and when they first meet me, like, wow, you're tall, and they'll, they'll comment on my body before they even really, like, say hi to me. And it's a really interesting experience, and I've had to really rewire myself to say, there's no shame in it. Just own it. It is what it is. You know, I sweat when I work out. I own that. It's okay. I'm six feet tall. People are going to comment about my body. It's okay. I stand tall when they do so now because I'm rewiring. I'm re redoing what it means to me when someone mirrors to me those things. And it, the power is all within us. That's the best part about this is the power is within, within us. If we can stop and be like, ooh, I'm feeling shame about that comment someone just made about my body or well, about it's, me. It's interesting you talk about standing tall too, because I'm the opposite, right? Yes. You and are kind of opposites. Yes. I'm 5'3", yeah. and I put on um, a bunch of weight after my twins. I even have my twin mama shirt on. Yes. Because, well, and let me explain that to you. My twin mama shirt is because this is the shirt I would wear so that I could justify all the weight that I have on my body. So I put on this t-shirt and then I'm like, okay, but everybody knows I'm a twin mama. So like, that's why, like I've, I carried two babies, like I've got two little girls, like that's, that's what's going on. Oh my gosh. I freaking love you. But, but that it's, gives inter me chills. <laughs> it's interesting share because that. like, I've always been short and I've always had a really big chest. And so that was always something that like drew, especially male attention in. And so I would always kind of hunch over, right. To like suck in the tummy yeah. and yeah. to like make the boobs not as like pronounced. Right. Yeah. And so for a long time, I didn't ever stand up straight. It's still something I'm teaching myself to do is to like stand up straight in that confidence in the body that I have, even yeah. if it's not the body, you know, that I had before I had had kids and to, to feel that confidence. So yeah. one of the things I said I would talk about at the, uh, as part of this, um, you know, this is to kind of talk about my book each day. I'm covering different chapters in the book. And the book, the chapter today is The Gift of Our Gut. And I talked about that this was the la actually the last chapter I wrote in the book. And the reason being is that I didn't know the power of the gut until I went to a training called M-braining or M-bit. It's multiple brain integration techniques. And um, we're actually doing that training. I just posted about it this morning. We're doing that training here in Missouri in a couple weeks. But that training taught me about the three brains we have in our bodies. In our, in our, we have brains in our minds. We have, we have brains in our hearts. And we have brains in our guts. So what do I mean by brains? I mean like we have neurons there that actually perform similar functions to our, our head brain. And our guts pr provide very specific, um, uh, have very specific prime functions. So it's safety is one. So that's mm -hmm. why we say things like, um, like I had a bad gut instinct yeah. or I had a bad gut feeling um, or I felt uneasy, right? Like those are things that we, we say. So um, having a, a bad gut feeling, so there's a safety element. There's our, our core identity who we are because our gut brain actually formed first before we were mm -hmm. our head brain, our first neurons that existed in our mother's womb were the start of our gut. And so that is where that like core identity lives. And then the other thing that our gut does is mobilization is movement. It gets us moving. It gets us to take action. And so when we say things like, I'm just stuck, I can't get there. I can't move on. You know, those are things that, that indicate that there's something going on in our gut. There's something happening in our, our gut brain. So like my favorite, I, I, I wrote so many poems. I don't know if you've read this chapter, Dana, but I've wrote so many poems in this chapter. Um, and I love them all, but I'm going to read uh, the first poem because I'll just start there because it, it kind of gives you the overview of, of the gut. So this is the gift of our gut. We often only know just what to do because our gut instinct gives us a clue. And we know ourselves because of you know who, our gut holds this identity too. Our gut brain gives the gift of pain, pain to protect us from our other brains. Our gut helps us to stay safe and secure to pr protect us with instinct when we're unsure. An instinct that knows when a threat appears based upon the experience of our many years. Of the years we've lived and those who've come before us, we scan our space for any risk in our radius. 
deep in the gut, our identity too resides to provide stability and to guide, guiding our decisions to be well aligned, aligned with the identity we've designed. Our gut helps us to process all we receive to determine what we will keep and relieve, relieving ourselves of all the waste of what needs to be erased. Our guts give us the greatest gift, the gift of knowing when to move or shift to protect our sense of who we are and from any permanent scar. Wow. Getting me chills. That was so beautiful. So, so what does it mean, you know, to trust our gut? You know, what is, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, what, what gets in the way of us trusting our gut? Do you, do you, have you had that experience? Absolutely. And, and this is such, I love this topic because it's right along with following your intuition, your inner guidance, all of those, those, those are all different ways of saying this topic, right? Yep. And I've, I've had some interesting observations in my own life as, as I've learned to trust my gut and take action. And um, I want to point something out that I think is really, really important. There was a time in my life where I, I had this opportunity to join this really big program. And my gut, my heart, everything said yes. And I felt just this total inner alignment and peace. And in my mind, when it said yes, I made all these assumptions of what that meant about the outcome. And it was so interesting because as I went into this program and continued there for two years, it turned out very different than I thought. Very, very different. And I left um, the company. I actually started working for them, left the company um, feeling a lot of things, hurt, um, wounded, betrayed, um, so many things. And, and I was shocked by the outcome. And I remember this really pivotal moment when everything just blew up, where where I started to think maybe I was wrong. Maybe that gut instinct was wrong. And I was like, wait a minute. No, I know where that's going to take me. And I committed in that moment to remember and to anchor back to no, I trust my gut and it doesn't always mean it turns out the way to that, that I think, but what did I learn from that? How did I grow from that? What are the gifts from that? And I started down that path of like trusting that even though it didn't turn out the way I thought, there was value and purpose in that learning and growing. And so I could have easily made meaning because that was a very emotionally impactful experience for me. And I could have made meaning of that and made that mean that I can't trust myself and then pattern that moving forward and had this lack of trust for years, years in business, in my own business. But instead I turned it around and said, I trust my gut, I trust my feelings and stepped into, okay, what are the gifts? What am I learning? How can I be better in my own business and in my work because of this experience? And it was such a powerful moment. And so all the listeners, that's my invitation to you is where in your life have you trusted your gut and it turned out different? And did you turn it on yourself? Mm -hmm. And it's time to turn that around. It's time to turn that around and trust your gut and find the learning, the growth, the impact, the, the why, why it happened, what's the gift in it. So you can, can really step forward and continue trusting your gut. Well, and I think what's important there too is um, understanding what we mean when we say trust our gut, because sometimes um, our hearts, um, you know, when, when you say our intuition, right, like our instinct or our intuition, unless you like really take the time to listen to your gut, your heart or your head are going to be more likely to win over. Your head's going to convince you it's the right thing to do, or your heart is going to make you feel like it's the right thing to do. It's going to, mm -hmm. it's going to give you passion, or you're going to be so excited, and you're going to be like, yes, this is awesome, this is amazing. And our guts are actually a lot more subtle. They are just like a little bit uneasy. They're just a little bit like something's off. And so you really have to slow down to listen. And one of the things that I noticed, and, and I talk about a number of different incidences in my life where I had a gut instinct to run away. I had a gut instinct to say like this relationship, and I talk about relationships, um, a, one that became a very abusive relationship and then a later in life relationship. And these relationships where I had a feeling that this person was not honest, you know, was not being who um, they really were inside or they were, they were not good for me. Maybe they weren't not saying they're evil, but like they weren't, it was not a good thing for me to trust. Right. And I ignored that 
because of my, my head and heart, I convinced myself that I was overthinking or I was, you know, I gave myself excuses and reasons not to follow that intuition. And so it really does take our, our gut brain works really slowly. It's like the rest and digest, right? So it's, mm -hmm. it works really slowly to give answers. And so when we go to listen to our gut, we really have to be really quiet. And we have to um, really look for those messages that are coming from our gut, um, especially when it's it's not when it's not coming up on its own. You know, when it's not like you're you have, you come into contact with someone, you immediately feel a reaction. Instead, when it's something you're trying to ask a question, is this the right thing to do? Is this the right program to join? Um, you really kind of have to drop into that space to to connect with that with that element or with that piece. In the book, I talk about the work when it comes to gut, the gut instinct, and really thinking about how often you're taking time to listen to your gut. We get so busy, like doing stuff all the time, and me, myself included, even knowing this. But now with this information, it makes me slow down a lot more when I'm making decisions that might have to do with, you know, either who I am my safety or whether I'm going to take action. Um, in those three incidences, it's like, okay, I really need to ask the question and, and drop into that space. So can you, can you give me an example? Like when you ask the question, are you bringing your awareness to what your gut feeling is? Yeah, your gut. Um, so your gut doesn't necessarily feel right our hearts feel so you're you're bringing yourself into what's the gut message what's the the um what's the and, and usually things that come from our gut are more a sense than they are like words are clear direction right it's more of like a solid like yes i feel yes or i feel no or i you know like that kind of or, or that person makes me feel sick like i actually feel a, you know, not good inside when I'm around them. Those are like good examples of, of a gut reaction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of the, the gut instinct chapter. And like I said, I love, there's like poems all throughout it because I just really found it so impactful to think about all the times that I had denied my gut. And I have denied mm -hmm. my gut a lot. I have pushed it aside and said, my head and heart know better you know, I love this person, or I think this person really is a good person. Just shut up, gut. Um, <laughs> here, let me give you a little more Frito chips or, you know, chocolate right. and just be quiet, right. um, which is actually often something we do to quiet our guts is we, mm. we feed it. Um, we give it things to, to silence it so that we don't have to hear its message. Mm. So the, the other chapter that was kind of how we started out around our bodies was around, um, how we respond to you know our bodies and how we how our early experiences with our bodies create um how we feel about them create how we see not just us but how we see the whole world and in the book i talk about um as a kid you know i talk about the red face and the sweating i also talk about like dirt and um, anything that would make me like grimy or, you know, not pretty, not sweet, not, you know, those things. And so I started to avoid anything like that. You know, I didn't want to go to the beach. I didn't want to lay in the grass. I didn't want to do the things that would cause me to, mm. to be dirty or to, you know, be messy because of, you know, wanting to, to be seen a certain way or to, to how I felt about my body, how I felt about myself um, in those ways. And when I went through some of the awakening process and the healing of how I started to see not just me, but every single other person so differently that when I would walk down the street or I would, um, see somebody, I just saw beauty. I just see like how amazing they look, how awesome that swimsuit is, how, you know, beautiful the leaves on the trees are and you see the world differently. Have you had that experience? So oh my gosh it is it's so true 
And that happens with self love that happens with how you treat yourself is how you treat others, how you see yourself is how you see others. Sometimes it's one of the easier ways actually to note how you feel about yourself. Because the ways that we judge others are the ways that we judge ourselves. That's really what it comes down to. And when I learned that about judgment, it was so powerful because I remember becoming aware of judgments or thoughts that I have about different people throughout the day and thinking, oh, that's how I would, that's how I would think about myself if I were that person. And I started to take full responsibility and accountability for my own thoughts, my own emotions. And when I did that and worked through that and, and began the process of understanding um, how to let those things go, I mean, I, this is probably one of the number one consistent things. I, the feedback I get from clients, from people I meet is, wow, you're one of the most loving people I've ever met. You know, my, my six-year-old actually said it best. Oh, it was so cute. He came up to me and goes, mom. I love your love. It is so yummy. And I'm like, oh, thank so you. Cute. Come here. And my boys, they just, they feel it. You know, it just showed me so much that he feels that flow, that, that love mm -hmm. from me. And it's because I've, I've spent a lot of years working on loving me mm -hmm. and letting go of judgments of me and seeing myself differently. And it takes time to undo those childhood things, you know, it takes time to undo that programming. And really what it, what it comes down to, what I found is the most, one of the key tools really is bringing love to something that had a lack of love growing up. Mm -hmm. You know, that shame oh, yeah. makes that, a lack of love. That's a perfect example. Cause that's what I talk about in the book actually was, um, you know, sand was one of my like nemesis. Yes. And when I went through this process, then um, last year, I took my kids to the beach. And to just be like, it's fine. It's yeah. fine. Yeah. It's fine to be the size that I am in the yes. space that I'm in. Yep. to Just be me on yes. the beach this way. Oh. I have twin Chills. girls. It's, you know, like Everywhere. it just is, you know, and, um, and before I probably would have tried not to do that, you know, tried not yeah. to sit in the sand and build castles with them and right. get dirty and just be that mm -hmm. way that would, I would have tried to avoid that. And so, yeah. um, it's a big, it's a big shift and it makes yeah. a big difference in how you experience living in yeah. your body, how you yes. feel living yeah. every day and not living it's not like um a weight loss journey right like i haven't lost right. weight like it's, right. it's not a weight loss journey as much as it is a journey to like being comfortable with wh wherever you are yes. within yeah. your body yes and that is the journey to achieving what you want you gotta get an alignment and a place of love internally before you're gonna get results that you actually want in your life that is reality because your thoughts and emotions create your actions your actions create your outcomes. And so those those thoughts and emotions are what you're getting in alignment, which is so, so powerful. And I want to just take this big picture for a second, because it's really important for us as women to understand, culturally, we've been carrying these programs for, for generations, that our worth and worthiness is wrapped in our looks. Because it used to be true. You used to be property. And the, the more beautiful, physically beautiful and perfect you looked, the more likely you were to get a, a wealthy suitor. And so livelihood was based on beauty. And we have to understand that is where these key things are coming from that have been passed down generationally, these ideas. And we're functioning off of these old ideas. And so it's why it's important to do this work because it will change and bless the next generation. For anyone here that has girls, this is vital work to be doing. This is important work to be doing to show the next generation of girls body love and the beauty of, of embracing all of you, all of your humanness, looking yourself in the mirror and telling yourself you're beautiful in front of your girls, you know, showing them what that looks like, mirroring to them these new patterns and new ideas and telling them they're beautiful inside and out, not just when they, they're wearing a princess outfit or, or they have fake makeup on. You know, they're beautiful even when they wake up in the morning and their hair's messy. You know, take them to the mirror and show them, show them, you know, that, that just woke up face and looks and say, you're so beautiful, you know, mm -hmm. show them those things. This is how we change cultural patterns on a large scale. And yeah. it's so, so important. It's a really important work to be doing. Well, and I'm, I'm not sure that it doesn't also apply to, to boys and men. 
Um, I just think body image um, issues and feeling comfortable in our bodies is really hard. And we go through so many changes and so many shifts and so many different stages of growth. And so I agree. I think a key element of it is like that shame I felt as a child, like of, of those teachers and people being like, what's wrong with you? Why is your face so yeah. red? Like that programmed into me for mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. to come. Like, don't run too hard. Don't, don't yeah. play this sporting game because you're going to get red and you're going to look weird. Like, don't do it. Just don't do it. And so, you know, it's something as parents, you know, me as a mom and, you know, to be thinking about is like, and my son's the same way now. He, his face turns bright red when he runs. Mm -hmm. Like he, yeah. it, it's a family trait. It's just what happens. And it's okay. And it's normal. And it doesn't mean we shouldn't go play. Like we yep. should play and we should work out and we should exercise and all yeah. that. So um, thank you, Dana, for, oh, uh, I think Maldina's got a question. You mentioned you have four sons. How are you teaching them to undo those patterns and to look at women differently? I'd love to hear I think that's that. such a good question. I do. I have four boys. Boys are just the story of my life. Um, I really think for me as a woman, as I own my body, own my presence, and, and I really speak highly of myself, I think that's such a huge part of it. Also teaching them boundaries and respect for women just in a very um, nonchalant way, you know, mentioning different things, mentioning to them how to treat women. Um, you know, we have open conversations about pornography. We have open conversations about why, um, you know, objectifying women, what that looks like, sounds like, of course, with my older boys, I do age appropriate. And I've done a lot of research on how to communicate with them and share with them. Um, in different ways and ways that their brains wire to certain things and why. And so it's just, it's some open dialogue and I kind of, you know, every child's different. Some of my children I recognize are more interested. Um, and like my second child has had a, a girlfriend, um, quote unquote girlfriend, since I can remember, like he's always had girls. He's always liked girls. And my older, it, it just, he, he takes a little bit more time. He uh, dating is like, ah, maybe all day. I'm going to take some time, you know? And so it just, it's age appropriate. I uh, research online how to talk. I listen to podcasts. Um, but I don't know if that fully answers your question. But I think my presence as a woman, owning my body, owning my space, being comfortable in my own skin, loving myself, those kinds of things um, matter a lot because our boys energetically imprint, my boys, my children, our, all of our children, energetically imprint on our ideas and our emotions about things. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think where I'm at matters a lot and makes a big difference. And so it's a matter of just meeting them where they're at, asking when they ask questions and chatting with them and researching and um there's great there's great books too that i use with my six-year-old like and like growing all the way up now there's so many amazing books you know girls can like pink too my son's favorite color has been pink since he was little and he also is like boys pink. can like pink too boys can like pink. yeah boys okay. sorry boys can like pink too yeah boys can wear pink yeah. too and my, he oh he wanted a barbie you know house as a as a kid and so we got him uh, when he was little as we yeah. got him one now yep. of course his sisters have it but you know like <laughs> so it's i think i think there's a lot there around i agree with you dana i think just how you show up how or how we show up as moms with our sons mm -hmm. makes a big difference and then exposure to that same yep. example as much as yep. as much as you can and, um, and then there's, you know, teaching them the good internal wisdom. I think that mm -hmm. that comes into play because when we shut off our like gut instinct, I think our natural way is kindness. It is, um, you know, a healthy interaction. I think it's the external influences that shift or change that. So trying to help, um, help kids reconnect with their three brains, um, can help them make good decisions about what feels right or doesn't feel right. And, you know, what, what behaviors they should be, um, or shouldn't be, uh, or choices they should and shouldn't be making. Right. Right. Yeah. And I just want to mention, uh, there's a book called The Awakened Family and Conscious Parenting, which will have great tips by Dr. Shafali. 
Yeah, Dr. Shafali. Yeah, she's, she's one of my favorite parent. Like I, she's my the parenting, any parenting stuff. Um, that's where I usually like to go. So, um, I highly recommend looking into her for for parenting, um, communication, all of that. So um, as we wrap up today, um, thank you guys for listening either now or when you catch the recording later. And um, I'm going to keep going with my book. I'll be live again tomorrow to talk about um, replenishing our souls. This is a, an interesting part, um, a part of the book. And I've got a story from when I first started writing my first book um, that contributed to, to that chapter. So um, look forward to, to continuing on this journey of, of going through my book. It's been an interesting experience already. And um, I will see everybody again tomorrow. Thank you, Dana, for jumping Thank on. Thank you. Thanks, Bye, everyone, everybody. for joining. Bye.